Hi, it's Linda with No Frills ASMR. I um, wanted to pop back in to discuss these movies that were nominated for Best Picture. I've seen them all. And I just thought we'd talk about each movie. Um, there may be spoilers. In fact, let's just say there will be spoilers. So if you're worried about that, <laughs> you might not want to watch it. I'll try not to like blow the movie. I'll just hopefully give you enough that it's like, oh, that's interesting. I want to watch that. But if you're worried about spoilers, I'll tell you before I start which movie I'm about to talk about. So you can decide if you want to fast forward or whatever. Um, I thought I'll just kind of do them in alphabetical order. So the first movie is a movie called American Fiction. And it is, was, is directed by Cord Jefferson. And he, I looked him up. He was a writer on The Good Place. Oh, I should start by saying I'm not a movie expert. I just saw these movies. I don't, you know, I don't know any, I don't have any special knowledge. Uh, this is just like an ASMR video to help you relax and sort of distract your mind. So um, there's that. But I did look up. So the director is Cord Jefferson. And yeah, he wrote on The Good Place. So just have that in mind because it's, it's, a, it's kind of a comedy drama, a dramedy maybe. Um, and about sort of important topics, but doesn't like preach at you in any way. Uh, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed this film. And it was funny because I was looking like on Reddit and people were like, oh, I was so disappointed. I didn't like it that much. And I, you know, it is funny, isn't it? Because I don't know why. I, I thought it was good. Um, it stars Jeffrey Wright and Sterling K. Brown, who you might know from that TV show. <laughs> What's it called? I never watched it, but my mom loves it. All of us? No. Oh, oh shoot. I should have written it down. <clears throat> it's that TV show that everybody loves. <laughs> so if you watch it, you'll know who I'm talking about. Sterling K. Brown. I believe they're both. Here. Jeffrey Wright's nominated for actor. And Sterling K. Brown's nominated for supporting, I think. And there's Erica Alexander and Issa Rae. She's great. Um, and other people. But the gist of the story is, and this will have a little bit of spoilers, but the main character, his name is Monk. It's Thelonious, but as a kid he got the nickname Monk for Thelonious Monk. And he is, at the beginning, he's a professor and he's talking about a book that uses the N-word. And one of the students is like a white girl. <laughs> and she's basically saying, you shouldn't use that or have that. And he's like, well, it's historical. And I think we're all adult enough. We can discuss this. And she gets mad and he ends up getting in trouble. <laughs> and then he's trying to write, you know, a new book. He's a writer, a very good writer, we, we learn. And, um, basically the publishers are like, mm, not right now. Right now we want, you know, a black novel. And he's like, I'm, you know, I'm writing, uh, how, how life is. And they're like, mm, no, <laughs> that's not what we're looking for. And so he goes to a writer's conference and sees that there is this book and I forget the title, but it's something with a lot of like, sort of tropes that you know black tropes that he's kind of offended he's like what is this you know it's I forget I wish I'd have written down the name of the book that but anyway so he kind of goes into the woman's you know novel she's the novelist is speaking about her book and she is like a graduate of some Ivy League school and you know very well spoken and yet then she picks up her book and starts reading and it's you know, all in this broken English and, you know, <laughs> and he's kind of looking at her like, what are you doing? You know, like, this is terrible what you're doing. And she's got the number one book out. Well, meanwhile, he's, mom has Alzheimer's and she's not doing so great. And somebody has to take care of her. And 
his sister is a, uh, she's some kind of doc. Oh, she works at a, like a family clinic. She's a doctor. And so they are talking about who, how are they going to take care of their mom and her, their mom has gone into debt and who's going to financially take care of the mother. And so, you know, it's kind of serious. And this is a spoiler. If you want to skip, I'm about to give you a spoiler. Um, so he's at lunch with his sister and they're both probably 50 ish, late forties. And his sister has a heart attack and dies. And that's when his brother, who's played by Sterling K. Brown comes home for the funeral and we meet him and he's a player and all this stuff. And, um, then he monk, um, has to figure out how he's going to pay to put his mom into a memory care facility because he just, she's running away and stuff from the house and getting lost. And his brother, Sterling K. Brown character has no money, has gone into debt. And so he decides to try to write, well, actually he doesn't decide. He just as a, as a, what's the word I'm looking for? As sort of like a joke, he writes a book that's sort of all black. And he, to prove to the publishers that they don't want that, that that's garbage. I mean, he writes what he considers the most garbage book ever with like gangsters and they're shooting each other and they're having the speeches that every, you know, movie you've ever seen has where it's like, how could you do this to me? You're my papa, you know, all this. And so he writes this book as a, as a, as proof that this is trash. <laughs> and he tells his publisher, his agent, you know, send this to the publishers. And the agent's like, I'm not going to, this is garbage. And he's like, yeah, exactly. They need to know that that's not what they want from me, you know? And so they end up sending it to the publishers. And of course, the publisher immediately is like, this is the best thing and everybody's going to want it. And they're going to want to make a movie out of it. <laughs> and they offer him $750,000 for the rights. And he needs the money. And he's written it under a pseudonym. pseudonym. So I don't think that was the right word. I forget what you call it when you write something under a different name as a writer. There's a name for it. But anyway, so he's like, well, I need the money. <laughs> so... he does that. I'm feeling like I need to go back to the beginning and say this will be spoilers because I'm telling you the story for sure. <laughs> anyway, so then <laughs> I'm going to keep going. It's a good one, you guys. So anyway, he gets the money to pay for his mom's care. And he meets a woman who lives near his mom's beach house. And they strike off, you know, strike up a romance. And he ends up a judge on a panel for best new, like, American fiction or something like that. And it's a funny scene when they ask him to be the judge on the panel. It's hilarious. But he ends up on the panel, and they end up bringing up his trash book that he wrote. And he's like, no, <laughs> this is bad. So anyway, it goes on from there, but it's good, and there's more to it after that um but I just think it's so well done because it's like a what's the word I'm looking for like a parody almost of I mean the the, the a plot <laughs> is sort of like you oh, that's not right parody's not the word trying to think of um, how to say it but like the fact that his sister died of a heart attack that's like the number one killer of you know women I don't know if it's a number one but it's a very often killer of women and especially women of color in America and his mom having Alzheimer's I think women black women are more likely to get Alzheimer's than anybody and so these are like real problems are brought up in this film 
but all the movie companies and the publishers want are these problems that are black people being in gangs shooting each other and this and that so if you want to sell <laughs> you had to write that and just writing about regular things that happen aren't going to get the publicity <sighs> anyway it's a good one and it's not in your face and it's not preachy it's funny and you'll enjoy it but it'll also make you go yeah that's stupid <laughs> Those things are ridiculous. I recommend that. That's a good one. Um, yeah. All right. Anatomy of a Fall. This was directed by Justine Tri Triet. Triet? Justine Triet. I think that might be. I don't know how you say it. It's French. It's a French woman. Uh, <clears throat> and it stars San Sandra or Sandra Hewler. Swan Arlaud, who plays the lawyer, and he kind of reminded me of my husband a little bit. Uh, Milo Marcado, I think that's how you say it. Milo Marchado, Granier, Grainer, he plays the son. Um, he's so good. The son is really good in this movie, and so is the, I mean, everybody. You know what? Acting across the board is excellent in all these movies, but in this movie, <laughs> so there's a family mm, are they in, they're in France but she's German and they met the couple met in I think England at university maybe I, I could have that wrong but they end up moving back to his home town of, in Germany and she's pretty miserable there and she's a writer and they have a son who is most you know who's blind I mean he can see like outlines maybe but he's blind and the husband or dad you know slash dad he one day is upstairs and he plays music very loud and he's playing like this reggae version of a Snoop Dogg song and he does it obviously kind of to annoy his wife <laughs> um but he ends up falling from a upper floor window and dying and the blind son finds him and of course as per usual when something like that happens they're going to look at the wife or the spouse and wonder if they had something to do with it so she ends up having to go to court in a French court and this was so different <laughs> I had no idea um, they can like anybody seems to be able to speak at any time and argue and <laughs> it was really interesting and a mess kind of but basically she gets held up in court for over a year I forget how long but it was over a year trying to fight for her innocence um, and they don't really have anything to go on that she did it but it's sort of questionable how he fell out of the window where he was and there's a blood splatter that's making people wonder and then the son is kind of in the middle of all this and is sort of separated from his mom during all of it and starts to be questioned by the court um, he has to stand there and answer and he starts to have doubts the son and it basically kind of really hurts their family what's left of it and then in the end I don't know I won't spoil it but it's a lot about how the whole system is kind of messed up <laughs> and it's good and the actors are excellent but I rented it on Amazon Prime and the subtitles didn't match up at all and it was nearly impossible to follow and watch it was hard, but I still really enjoyed it. But I do think that affected my viewing of it for sure. Both of these I watched at home streaming. Okay. Barbie. Barbie, I saw at the movie theater. But I went to, it was sort of sold out, and I had to go to like this old, older movie theater. And it was jam packed, and the seats are too small. 
and it was sticky and the sound was not very well done at all at this movie theater. It was kind of a disappointment, not the Barbie part, but the movie theater part. I was like, gosh, this isn't great, you know? Like, if you're going to get people to pay $20 a ticket, the sound needs to be correct. And the sound was weird, and I, honestly, it was a bad showing. However, <laughs> this is a fun movie. It's Barbie, the Barbie doll. Um, all the Barbies live in whatever they call it, Barbie land or something. <laughs> Oh, it's directed by Greta Gerwig, who's great. Love Greta. <laughs> Love her. Um, and stars Margot Robbie as Barbie. And she is obviously one of the best actors there is, I think. She's awesome. Also, she looks like a Barbie doll. So she was absolutely perfect in that part. Um, and then Ryan Gosling plays Ken. And he is a talented guy musically. And he sings and stuff in this movie and he is wonderful <laughs> really really liked him in it um and then there's Kate McKinnon plays kind of like the Barbie that all the you know everybody draws on and cuts their hair and breaks their legs <laughs> she's funny um and then America Ferrara is how you say her name she's kind of the human person her daughter I don't have her name here but she was good too but anyway, so it's sort of a, I don't know what you'd call it, like a comedy, fantasy, you know, and the Barbie world itself is so cool to look at. It looks like how you think <laughs> a Barbie world would look. I thought that was really cool. But anyway, so Barbie's like living her perfect life, having parties every night. All the Kens are in love with all the Barbies. Ken's only purpose in life is to like get Barbie to pay attention to him and it's all cute um but then Barbie starts to like wonder about think about death and dying and she brings it up and all the other Barbies are like don't what no don't talk about that you know and it it's all kind of interesting and then she decides she's gonna try to leave Barbie world and go see what the real world is like it kind of reminded me of Truman Show a little bit, if you've seen that movie, where like they're in this perfect world, but they kind of are yearning for something more. Um, that's kind of how the Barbie movie is. But anyway, so she um, leaves the Barbie world and goes into the real world and of course experiences <laughs> sexism and um, and Ken gets out there and then he kind of sees like men aren't just there for Barbie like men get to be in charge <laughs> and Ken really digs that and that's sort of funny um and Barbie learns that some women don't love Barbies and Barbie isn't always like the ideal you know and so it it was it was interesting and then they go back with some real people to Barbie world and the Kens have kind of made it like a man's world <laughs> and it's all funny um I, th I think it's it's a it's a fun movie it also speaks a lot about feminism and you know how women kind of feel and are treated in society I know that some men who have sort of more <laughs> I don't know how to say it sensitive <laughs> to feeling like, I don't know how to say it, but they might be slightly offended in a way um, because they feel like I don't do that. So they shouldn't make it like all men do that. Well, they're not, calm down. <laughs> but anyway, it's a good movie and I laughed. I actually cried maybe twice. <laughs> um, I wish I had seen it with a group of women instead of men <laughs> uh but yeah it's it's good it's good um all right what's the next one in line the holdovers is the next okay this movie hold on let me look at my note on who directed it alexander payne and he directed sideways if you've seen that one an election which was a long time ago but it was a good movie um and it stars paul giamatti 
who's really good in it, and a guy named Dominic Sessa. And I think this is his first part ever. Um, but he was really good. And then I, I might say her name wrong, but I think it's Divine Joy Randolph. And she was a person who, when she came on screen, I'm like, oh yeah, I recognize her. I think from like, I don't know, <laughs> other movies, you know, I couldn't quite think of what, but she's really good. She plays the cook. Um, but it's basically this all boys school and there's like this curmudgeon deal instructor who works there who is played by Paul Giamatti and he mm, has to stay on over Christmas break to watch the boys who don't have the opportunity to go home over Christmas and a bunch of those boys end up it's like five boys are gonna stay over but it ends up one of the rich boys is able to take them all to the mountains to go skiing but the one boy his mom won't answer the phone when the call comes in to get permission for her boy to go skiing I think that's right so he ends up staying so it's just the one boy and Paul Giamatti and the cook and the three of them are there at this school over Christmas break and during that time of course you know they fight and they bond and they learn about it you know each other and really get to understand each other more and um and the cook's son had died in uh the Vietnam War I think and so, you know, there's a lot, they go through a lot, but it's really good and really, it makes you feel good. It's just sort of a feel good movie with great acting. I loved it. I don't quite know what else to say about that, <laughs> but I recommend watching it. It's good. Okay. What's next? Oh yeah. And it's set in the 1970s. So that's kind of fun too. I just like a period piece. All right. Alphabetically next is Killers of the Flower Moon. This is a Martin Scorsese, Scorsese movie. Um, I think he says it's going to be his last directing movie. Um, yeah. Uh, it stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Lily Gladstone, who's very good, um, Robert De Niro. Of course, they're all, you know, they're all great. Uh, it's about, I read the book, and I have to say the book is excellent. I recommend the book. Um, but it's about the Osage Nation, which is a Native American um, nation in the United States, if you don't know that. Uh, and their land has oil. I think it's oil. Although, yeah, shoot, I was going to look this up before I started this video and see what the time period is. But I feel like it's the 1930s maybe or 40s but um so the the members of the Osage nation become very very wealthy and so a lot of uh white men go there and really woo the women <laughs> and get them to marry them and then they mysteriously turn up dead a lot of women of the Osage nation turn up dead and the men end up inheriting or, you know, being willed the mineral rights to the land, I think, forever. <laughs> I think is how that works. So, um, you know, it's dark. And basically the, the police in the area don't do anything about figuring out who did it. And this is something that goes on to this day with Native American women disappearing and not being re uh, searched, not being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, the police don't do anything. <laughs> They're not being, what's, I can't think of the word. I don't know why, my brain's doing something funny right now. They, basically nothing's done about it. And I've been listening to podcasts about it. It's absolutely terrible. <laughs> But that's part of what this is about. It's an important story. It's a good movie with lots of good actors. 
for me personally, it is way too long. Like, I just for, I don't, I felt like it went on and on and on. <laughs> um, and there's sort of like a twist with one of the characters who you think is kind of a good guy, but he's not. But I felt like I figured the twist out well early of when it came out. And it just, there was a point where we paused it and to get a glass of water or whatever. And it was, you're thinking, oh, it's almost over, but I'm going to pause it. There was like an hour and 48 minutes. <laughs> and you sort of go, oh boy, you know? So I would say if you're going to watch it, I'd pick a, a Sunday <laughs> early afternoon when you're just going to sit around all day and make a day of it because <laughs> it's a lot and too much honestly I I think it needs a hard edit <laughs> if somebody did a hard edit and put out like a mm, hour and you know 50 minute version I'd, I'd watch it <laughs> I'm sorry to everybody who loves that maybe this is just that's just how I felt maybe it's because I'm getting old I can't sit still that long I don't Okay, alphabetically next we have Maestro. This um, is a Bradley Cooper. I think, he, yeah, he directed it, but he also stars in it with Carrie Mulligan. Um, it's the story of Leonard Bernstein and his wife, Felicia. Um, I really did enjoy it. <laughs> I did. I liked it a lot. I thought, I love Bradley Cooper. I actually think he's going to kind of go down as one of the great actors maybe actor directors. I think he's excellent. Um, he plays Leonard Bernstein and it's really the story of, uh, it's almost the story of their relationship and not the story of him. So if you're watching it because you're like, Oh, I know West side story and I'd like to learn more about that composer. That's not really what you're getting. You're getting the story of Felicia and everything she went through to be married to him and the story of their marriage. It's not really the story of him, I think. But, you know, he was, um, he had his addiction, you know, drink, he was drinking too much. He sometimes took drugs. He cheated on her and wasn't a great husband. She was forever patient and loving and put up with a lot. Um, it's beautifully shot. It looks great. The whole thing looks great. Uh, it was, it was, it was good, but it's the kind of story we've kind of been through before. I'd still, I still enjoyed it a lot. My husband liked it more than I did. He really liked it. Um, but it was good. I don't know what else I can say about that. It's the story of their marriage. Um, and if I tried to like explain that, it's just sort of a linear story of a couple meeting. He's bisexual. He sometimes steps out on her. She kind of turns her head the other way and puts up with it. He drinks too much. He deals with depression. Mm, you know, that story. <laughs> This is a biggie. All right, so this is a Christopher Nolan film. If you've seen Memento, that's Christopher Nolan. Um, he's a very interesting director. I was so excited to see this movie because I love Christopher Nolan. Um, it stars, how do you say his name? Cillian Murphy? Cillian Murphy, who was in that show I don't even know the name of it, Beaky Binders, Beaky Blinders, is it Binders or Blinders, I don't know, anyway, I haven't watched it yet, but my kids all love that show, um, so he's in it, and Florence Pugh, Robert Downey Jr., I think Robert Downey Jr. has been nominated for Best Supporting Actor, and Slay Murphy for Best Actor, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon has a role as a general or whatever, something like that, and he's, he's sort of a little bit of, um, comedic relief, <laughs> But he's really good. I really enjoyed him. And Gary Oldman is in it. Um, so, 
uh, let's see, how do I explain Oppenheimer? <laughs> it's this movie is about Oppenheimer who um, created. That's not the right word, but figured out how to create to make an atomic bomb, to put all the pieces together that it would make an atomic bomb. I'm not a, I'm not a science person, <laughs> and um, but this movie is really more about the man than the bomb. So just know that you know it's not. It's about him, and his wife and his girlfriend, <laughs> more than it's about actual atomic bomb and the uh what happened with that the after effects and everything um so Oppenheimer in this movie at kind of in the beginning well in the beginning he's in school and he gets mad at his professor and he almost poisons him <laughs> I mean there's a lot like about his personality the build-up but then he gets appointed to work on the super secretive Manhattan project and so he's working on creating a an atomic bomb. And there's a lot of like sort of subplots like with the other scientists whose names I can't think of right now, but he's working on what the hydrogen bomb, is that it? And they're kind of odds over which one's better. Mm, I don't know. Anyway, um, but so he's developing the atomic bomb. And Matt Damon is the guy who's kind of recruited him and he's the military guy and he's like, this thing has to get done. We got to get this. And it's sort of like the old, you got to do it within the next, you know, month or all or whatever. So he does figure it out and then they do a test run on it. And that's sort of the halfway point of the movie. And it's awesome. It's awesome. Like, you know, you're getting all these snippets of the atomic energy and everything, and then the bomb goes off, and that moment's pretty awesome. Um, and then there's sort of like a part two of the movie, I would say. Like, that's kind of the first half, and then there's a second half where um, uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character, who is... Um, What's his name? Lewis. No. Lewis Strauss. Like Levi Strauss. Lewis Strauss. <laughs> okay. He is a, I think this is right. He's like a con, con, congress, congressman. Blah, blah, blah. And at that time, Oppenheimer is um, part of the USAEC, which is the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, during the Cold War, so this is a little after the war. And I should say, right after he develops the bomb, they end up, you know, uh, historically we all know, they they bomb Hiroshima and um, I'm sorry, my brain's doing something again. <laughs> okay, so they bomb Japan and Oppenheimer calls Matt Damon's character and he wants to get information about the bombing and like what happened and how it went and just stuff like that. And Matt Damon's the government, you know, that's who he stands in for is the military. And he basically says, you don't have any say in it now. You're out. We just needed you to do that. And you're not. And that's kind of interesting because up until that point, all the scientists are debating the pros and cons of building this thing and what it'll mean for society. And, you know, they're having these debates, but as soon as they actually create, create it, they give it to the military. They don't have any say in it anyway. Like all their, you know, debates about it don't matter because the military has a hold of it. They don't have any say in it anymore. So that was kind of interesting actually. But, um, so then the second part of the movie is dealing mostly with this um, Louis Strauss, who's played by Robert Downey Jr. And during a congressional hearing, Oppenheimer kind of said something that I don't remember even now, but something about like Strauss said, well, what about if this part of the bomb is gets loose? 
how dangerous, you know, what, what do you have to say for that? And Oppenheimer basically tells him, you don't know anything. You don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about like, I think it was something like a, a hammer and a ham sandwich. Like you don't even know that these things don't go together. Like that's how clueless you are. So mind your business. And that really kind of upset Louis Strauss. I could have a lot of this wrong, guys. There's a lot to this movie. And so Louis Strauss starts accusing Oppenheimer of being a communist because way back when his wife was part of the Communist Party. And he hung out. Mm, he had an affair with uh, Florence Pugh's character, who was a communist. So he has to go through all these, mm, not trials, but like trials, I, I can't think of, you know, to prove that he's not a communist and a spy and stuff. So that was the second half. And during that, there's the whole thing with Einstein. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's almost too much. I don't know if I can explain all of Oppenheimer. But there is scenes that are in black and white and scenes that are in color. And I heard that Nolan, the director, said the black and white scenes are from Louis Strauss's perspective and the color scenes are Oppenheimer's. So when you watch the movie, if you kind of know that, that's kind of interesting because you see Oppenheimer differently depending on whether it's color or black and white. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. But in the end, I think a lot of these scientists were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have done that. But if they hadn't done that, somebody else would have. So it's tough, <laughs> basically. Okay, that's Oppenheimer. Um, past lives. Let me get my note on who directed it. Oh, I do know who directed it. This is Celine's song. Is the name of the woman who directed it. And I think she was a playwright and had written a play about this. I think I remember reading that. She's like a Canadian director, writer. Um, and this movie is sort of based on her life, her real life experience. Um, and it stars Greta Lee. I might say this name wrong, but I think it's Teo Yu and John Magaro. And it's about a little girl who lives in South Korea and she's living her happy little life <laughs> and there's a boy in her class in elementary school and they sort of compete on who's the smartest <laughs> and he gets mad when she beats him and um but they have like a nice relationship and then as they get a little bit older they go on a date and their moms are there kind of chaperoning them on a date and then the one family says we're immigrating to America. So they pack her up and pack everything up and they end up going to the U.S. and make a life there. And she kind of mm, feels more, by the time she's in college, she sort of has these moments where she is with I, I kind of forget how that worked, but I feel like she was with some people who were from South Korea and she felt more American than South Korean. Like she felt like she was neither. She was neither American nor South Korean. Like now she's something in between. And it was kind of interesting. And she ends up meeting a man and marrying him, falls in love, marries him and they have a happy marriage. But through the time, the 20 years that have gone by since she left, she has, I feel like it's been a while since I was maybe, but she occasionally like touched base with the boy from her childhood and maybe they kind of online dated for a minute but then that didn't work out that's when she got married I think and then somehow they reconnect and he comes to visit her and I think she's living in New York City I think that's where they were and her and her husband like I said they're happy they have a nice life in New York and so this man comes to visit and they just have this like wonderful day out and you're watching it like you know they're so you know like sweet together and it's so many memories and so much you know like shared experience with um being South Korean and it really brings up all these memories from her past and um they end up going out to dinner 
with her husband and her and this man. And at first she's translating everything for her husband to understand. But, you know, that becomes um, a lot. And, and they just start having a conversation in Korean that the husband can't understand. And it's very, very good. And the husband is, the American husband is not like a jerk or anything about it. You know, you like... He's he totally understands it, and it's just really nice. And then they she ends up saying goodbye to the the guy from Korea, and I cried, you guys, because <laughs> it's so it's so beautiful, it's just so good, and it's really about not just romance at all, I'd say, but it's about giving up your identity as a person like her South Korean um it's so different where she is now and you know her history in South Korea and everything she's kind of saying goodbye to that and it's very it's good <laughs> I'm almost gonna cry thinking about it I thought it was beautiful I thought it was beautiful though. and I did spoil that one a bit but I'd watch it it's so where are we at, guys? Poor things. Okay. This is directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. I'm not really familiar, I admit. Um, it stars Emma Stone, who I think is nominated for Best Actress. Mark Ruffalo, I think he's nominated for Best Supporting, too. Willem Dafoe and Rami Yosef and others. Um, and it's sort of a, a Frankenstein story it's got like this sort of like steampunky surrealist vibe to it it's really interesting to look at it's kind of like London in the future past <laughs> I don't know it's got a little bit of everything going on um but William Defoe is kind of playing like a sort of Dr. Frankenstein-esque guy and he has kind of created a Frankenstein monster that is Emma Stone um but she's not quite Frankenstein because she has like the brain of a a baby in her and she has to um, kind of grow up through time and learn. Um, it's full of sex. So if that would bother you, like lots of sex. <laughs> so don't watch it with your kid. Um, it's because she's sort of learning how to be a woman and she doesn't understand any of the social norms at the time. So she just kind of does what she feels she wants to do. And, um, yeah. So it's interesting. It's like a, it's like a, she ends up going off with this Mark Ruffalo, Ruffalo character who's sort of a, you know, a player kind of guy. And he takes her off to, Paris and then he realizes he can't quite handle her she's a little crazy you know because she just does things that aren't socially okay and he thinks he's into that but it gets to be a little much so he takes her on a cruise ship so he can kind of keep her in one place and she don't like that very much <laughs> and then I don't know I don't know how much more. she sees poor people and feels really bad for them and steals basically kind of takes all of Mark Ruffalo's money and gives it away to the poor people and ends up working at a uh, brothel <laughs> and has all kinds of sex but sort of fights for women's rights within the brothel anyway yeah so it's interesting um I think it needed some editing, like heavy editing. I thought it was way too long. I thought there was a lot that I would have trimmed up. Um, there's one character on the ship who, as soon as he started talking, it felt like he didn't quite belong in the movie. And it was funny because I sort of felt that way, but I was like, well, I guess he's American on the ship and he's a tourist or whatever, but... I mentioned it to my husband. He goes, I felt that exact same way. Like that character just didn't really fit. And also he took her out to see the poor people, but that was like his only role. It was kind of weird. I don't know. I didn't quite get that character. Um, but yeah, I needed some, 
that needs some editing. <laughs> okay, last but certainly not least, Zone of Interest. This is a movie directed by Jonathan Glazer, Glazer, and stars Sandra Hewler. Hewler? Hewler. She's German, and there's an umlaut, umlaut over the U. I'm going to go with Hewler. Christian Friedel. Rudolf Haas. Oh, no, that's the name of the guy. Sorry, I wrote down some names here. Christian Friedel plays Rudolf Haas. Haas. And I looked up that Rudolf Haas because he's a real-life German person from, you know, world from the Nazi party in World War II. And this guy who played him looks so much like him. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's crazy. But this Sandra Hewler... I didn't realize it until I was looking this up. She's the same person <laughs> who was the star of Anatomy of the Fall. And she's amazing in both of these movies. Like, give her an Academy Award because she's awesome. I had, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know it was the same person playing both these parts. I loved her in Zone of Interest. Okay, so Zone of Interest is about... Okay, Rudolf Haas, I guess that's how you say it, and his wife, Hedwig, they build, basically, their dream home. I think they build it. I'm not sure. It could have been there, and she just added, like, a greenhouse and everything. I wasn't quite clear. But anyway, it's right outside of the gates of Auschwitz, and he is the commandant of Auschwitz, and I might use the wrong word. I don't know if it's commandant or general. What is it? I don't know. He's a manager. I don't know. He's the guy in charge. And it is like literally you can see the wall and the barbed wire. And that's their fence for their property. And she is creating a home for her five children right there outside of Auschwitz. It is this movie, you guys. <laughs> this movie is so good. And it's sort of a quiet movie in that you're just watching it and this is just their family having their little family life but you know what's going on um there's a moment where it's his birthday and he gets dressed in uniform and all the other Nazis come to you know shake his hand and say happy birthday so it's like you know what's going on however if you're not paying attention and think, oh, it's just a quiet movie, I can look at my phone or whatever, don't do that because it, you have to really be paying attention to the sound design. Like, very, very... Now, I don't know. I saw it at home streaming, not in the movie theater. So I'm not sure how it's different in the movie theater. But when you watch it at home, there's, like, scenes inside her house when she's trying on a fur coat that has been taken from a Jewish person who was probably murdered. Um, and she's, like, walking down the hall with her dog and things like that. And you can hear gunshots and screams in the background. But they're so well done for the sound. It's just... It would be like if you heard a lawnmower out the window while you were... You might not notice it. You know what I mean? And then there are some scenes where they're sitting in the gar garden and you see the smoke from a train. You don't see the train at all. You just see the smoke. And honestly, there was one time when my husband goes, oh, look, there's the smoke. And I didn't even notice it. And I was looking right at the screen. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, I see that now. And, um, and everything is from the point of view of this family and the kids and like there's a little boy uh, it's 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 a lot it's really it's really well done um and the people who work at their house from what i understand they're all people from the town of auschwitz and they're 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 working but they you know i don't know it's good it's a good movie i'm not sure what else to say about it um well, the, the dad in the movie, Rudolf Haas, who's a real person in real life, um, it's based on, but it, like, based on, but you know, they didn't, I don't think they had all the information. They just were like, what if you were this kind of thing? Um, but he, 
they, there's a scene where he designs or okays the design for the new crematorium at Auschwitz. And like the next day he's with his children and they're out on, it's kind of a kayak or a canoe or something like that. And they're swimming in the water and he realizes all this ash is coming in on the water. Oh my God. It's so, ugh. And so then he's loading his kids up and they all get kind of covered in this ash. And I didn't really understand because they went back and they were scrubbing and scrubbing as if, as if it was painful, you know, just scrubbing. And I thought, oh, I mean, I assume the family's disgusted that this happened and also that, you know, whatever. And they're super, I mean, they're definitely Nazis. Like the mom is, well, she's not... Um, unknowing of what's going on. She knows darn well what's going on. But later I read, I kind of looked it up, and apparently having ash like that on your skin will burn. It'll feel like acid. And so I guess that's part of why. But it was just horrible, just horrible. And then, um, um, oh, there was, oh, yeah, so he designs that. And I think because of that, he did such a, mm, you know, for the Nazis, what they'd consider a good job of murdering millions of people, that they promoted him, and they were going to have to leave, and she was like, Hedwig is just fighting to stay, because it's their home, and it's so beautiful, and she's created this wonderful home, and oh my gosh, you guys, it's just, whew, it is something, um, But I feel like it should win for editing and for sound design. I don't know if it will. <laughs> and I think this should win for Best Picture. I just thought this movie was really, really good. Um, and I don't think that you see a Jewish... That I remember. I don't think you see a Jewish prisoner or inside of the camp. Anything like that at all. Never during the movie. It's all just... It's like they know you know what's going on, and they don't have to show it, you know. But on top of all that, there is some really interesting editing going on, um, direction going on. Uh, there are scenes with, like, using night vision, and there's scenes where they jump to current day. Just really well done. Um, that I thought were surprising and cool. <laughs> and, you know, there's, like... I don't know. I've already spoiled everything. It's hard to know. <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to have to reshoot this because I over-spoiled. I don't know. But anyway, this movie, I'd watch it. Did we get them all? I think we did, guys. I can't believe it. <laughs> all right. Well, have you watched any? What do you think? Do you guys agree or no? I know that like Pat, no, not Pat, like Poor Things is getting great. Like people love it. So I feel like mm, maybe I'm just like too, too old for it. You know, like maybe it's too like hip for me, the whole steampunk, I don't know, aspects of it. I, it that one I wanted to do editing. This one I wanted to do editing. <laughs> um, maybe even a tiny bit on it. This one, I think I'd enjoy more if I'd had better subtitles. They were just not good on the one I watched. Um, anyway. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm, if I over-spoiled or under-spoiled, I'm sorry. 